If something goes wrong on the way to Mars, the distress call can take up to 22 minutes to reach Earth, and there won't be any quick way back. It's a trip of nearly a thousand days with no possible rescue, across an abyss of millions of kilometers. Even so, right now NASA engineers, ESA scientists, and SpaceX teams are assembling the pieces of a plan that could change the course of human history forever, taking real people, people like you and me, to live, even if only for a while on another planet. But have you ever asked yourself why, more than 50 years after the moon landing, we still haven't gone to Mars? Why is it so hard? Before imagining futuristic domes and red cities under a pale sky, we need to face the raw numbers. When the United States landed on the moon in the 1960s and 1970s, 12 astronauts walked on a celestial body just 384,000 kilometers away. The Apollo missions took about three days to get there. The International Space Station, meanwhile, orbits roughly 400 kilometers above Earth's surface, closer than many capitals are to each other. Mars, on the other hand, is at least 55 million kilometers away. Even during the best launch windows, getting there takes something like six months. In some orbital alignments, it can take more than nine. And when the crew finishes working there, they can't just flip a switch and head home. They have to wait for the next favorable window, which means staying on Martian soil for over 500 days. Adding outbound trip, stay, and return, a typical mission stretches to around 900 days, two and a half years away from home, without immediate tech support, without logistical backup, without a space ambulance. Distance, however, is only the first step of this Everest. Logistics is the real maze. Compare. In 1962, Mercury Atlas 6 used a 120 metric ton rocket to put a 1.2 metric ton capsule into low Earth orbit. Apollo 17, the last moon mission, needed a Saturn Vive of about 3,000 metric tons to send roughly 50 metric tons to the vicinity of the moon. Now jump a scale. Reasonable estimates for a crewed mission to Mars with six astronauts talk about up to 1,250 metric tons of fuel, supplies, habitable modules, propulsion systems, and surface vehicles. That's a quantity of mass humanity has never sent all at once. In practice, you need a fleet of heavy launches, on the order of at least 10 liftoffs by Saturn V, or current SLS-class rockets, to assemble in Earth orbit, the ship and the entire package that will head for the Red Planet. And there's more. On Mars, everything essential has to be waiting for the crew before they arrive. Unlike the ISS, which gets regular resupply missions, a Martian base must be born at least minimally ready and tested. Pressurized habitats, power generation modules, communication systems, surface vehicles, laboratories, and above all, a reliable way to produce the propellant for the trip back. That's where a seductive and risky concept comes in. ISRU, in situ resource utilization. In theory, you can capture the abundant CO2 from Mars's atmosphere and combine it with hydrogen obtained from ground ice to manufacture methane and oxygen via the Sabatier process. In practice, no system like this has been validated off Earth at full scale under Mars's brutal swings of temperature, dust, and radiation. It sounds like a technical detail, but it's the line that separates a round trip from a mission with no return ticket. Would you stake the crew's lives on a fuel plant that has never actually run on Mars? Even if the factory runs like clockwork, there's still the human factor, and here the body exacts a heavy price. We know from ISS experience that six months in microgravity leads to muscle and bone loss, cardiovascular changes, a weakened immune system, and a decidedly unfriendly list of forced adaptations. On a mission to Mars, the travel legs alone add up to more than a year in microgravity before the team faces the planet's partial gravity, about 38% of Earth's. What does that mean day to day? More demanding movement, higher fracture risk, fatigue, challenges using tools and suits, and a body that may take time to remember what it's like to live underweight after so long. Artificial gravity like in the movies? It's still more of an engineering hypothesis than a ready solution. Maybe in a few decades. And it's not just the body that suffers. The mind goes along for the ride. Confinement, monotony, extreme isolation. In analog simulations, from Antarctic bases to the HIC's project in Hawaii, we see high stress, interpersonal conflicts, cognitive fatigue, mood swings, and cohesion challenges. Add to that a communication delay that can hit 22 minutes between a question and an answer, and you see why selection, psychological training, and daily routines for living together become as vital as any control panel. 
Is it possible to get through nearly a thousand days with the same team in a limited space, solving critical problems calmly and clearly? That's one of the hardest questions, and it isn't solved with bolts. Outside, space doesn't forgive. Beyond Earth's magnetic embrace, astronauts face galactic cosmic rays and highly energetic solar particles. Calculations indicate that a trip to Mars can expose the crew to levels that, in total, exceed what NASA considers safe for an astronaut's entire career. Can you mitigate it? Partly. Thicker shielding, internal modules with hydrogen-rich walls, water, polyethylene, and other polymers, storm shelters to protect the crew during solar events, and on Mars, habitats partially buried to use regolith as a natural shield. All of that helps, and all of that adds mass. And mass, as you've probably guessed, costs fuel. Once again, the blanket is short. Now suppose we manage to launch cross space, land safely, and begin operations. The mission doesn't become routine. It enters its most uncertain chapter, maintenance far from any workshop. On the ISS, a faulty valve can be replaced on the next cargo ship. On Mars, no. Every filter, every pump, every life support component needs redundancy, diagnostics, and a contingency plan. 3D printers to fabricate parts, adaptable toolkits, repair manuals designed for situations where the internet doesn't reply right now. A single failure in a vital system, air purification, water filtration, thermal control, can go from inconvenient to existential threat in hours. On a planet where opening the door to get some fresh air isn't an option, reliability becomes synonymous with survival. So why insist? because there's a strategy underway. With the Artemis program, NASA intends to use the moon as a testbed for long-duration operations, generating power, closing water and air loops, and validating habitation and logistics technologies that can then be translated to Mars. SpaceX is moving in parallel with the Starship program, betting on reusability and very high payload capacity to lower the cost per kilogram and make a multiple launch architecture viable. ESA, for its part, is investing in life support research, robotics, and autonomous vehicles. The most prudent outlook foresees robotic pre-installation missions in the 2030s, delivering and assembling parts of the future base in practice. And if everything goes right, the first human steps on the red planet in the 2040s. It's not tomorrow, but for the first time, there's a map with arrows pointing forward. And when we get there, the truth is that colonizing Mars will look much less like building a city and much more like operating a permanent submarine. The atmosphere is about 95% carbon dioxide. The average temperature hovers around minus 60 degrees Celsius with swings that challenge both equipment and people. Dust storms can swallow continents and, at times, the entire planet for weeks, reducing sunlight and coating solar panels with a thin, relentless layer. Every step outside the habitat is a technical outing, planned and monitored. Energy, communication, water, food, oxygen, nothing comes naturally. Everything is engineering. Is it hostile? Yes. But it's also a colossal open-air laboratory. Geology preserved for billions of years. Signs of ancient water. A unique opportunity to test technologies that, sooner or later, will come back as benefits on Earth. Between risk and reward, there's a reason that may weigh more than all the others. Our stubborn inclination to cross frontiers. That's what led people to cross oceans and to touch the moon less than a decade after we decided we would. The urge to ask, what if, has always been costly, in sweat, in ingenuity, in courage, but it's what took us out of the cave and made us look up. Mars is the next big question, and the path to answering it demands refined engineering, applied science, physiology, psychology, and a collective discipline that rarely makes headlines but saves lives. None of this means we're ready. We still lack robust ISRU tests off Earth, demonstrations of precision landing for heavy payloads, reliable autonomous navigation in a dusty environment, effective shielding that doesn't make the vehicle impractical, health protocols that keep body and mind on track for a thousand days, and, above all, the ability to perform maintenance without relying on a guardian angel in low Earth orbit. The sensible plan is to iterate. First robots delivering and testing everything, then short missions, then longer stays. Small steps, but firm ones. Even so, there's an image that's hard to shake. A fresh footprint in the red dust, a few meters from a module gleaming under a distant sun. An antenna turning slowly, sending messages home with a delay, but sending them. A human group learning to live in another world, not as an escape, but as an extension. Is it scary? 
Yes, and precisely for that reason, it's fascinating. If we could go to the moon when computers filled rooms and the internet was fiction, what are we capable of now that we carry supercomputers in our pockets and can print complex parts in hours? Mars is the most challenging journey we've ever set before ourselves. Not because of one gigantic problem, but because of the accumulation of dozens of big ones, each demanding solutions that are elegant, redundant, and tested. It's a puzzle that only fits when all the pieces lock into place. And when it does, it won't just be the conquest of a destination. It will be a new way of existing, of designing, cooperating, deciding, and surviving in hostile environments. A handbook of resilience that ultimately also serves the planet where we were born. Now, I want to hear from you. Knowing all this, the communication delay, the radiation, the heavy logistics, the 500-day wait on Martian soil, and the marginless return, would you sign up for a mission of nearly a thousand days? Or do you think we still need to mature a lot of technology before we try? Maybe send AI-driven robots instead of humans? Leave your opinion in the comments. If this video helped you see the challenge more clearly, subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications to follow the next chapters of this epic story. Who will reach the red planet first, NASA, ESA, or SpaceX? Thank you for watching, and see you in the next video.